And joining us now to talk elections, Greg Essensup, who is Ontario's Chief Electoral Officer. Nice to have you in that chair. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, from time to time, we'd like to have the people uh, in this studio who kind of run the um, major institutions of our province. So that's why we've invited you in. And I guess for starters, we want to find out what you do. So what do you do? Well, as Chief Electoral Officer, I'm responsible for all aspects of the Election Act and the Election Finances Act. So that means running all of the general elections in Ontario, by-elections, referendum, as well as the provisions under the Election Finances Act pertaining to political parties, their financial filings, their annual filings, and enforcement of those statutes. So you're in charge of the voters list as well? Yes, I You've got to make sure it's up to date. Absolutely. As complete as possible. Yes. What advantages are there to your compiling that list as opposed to, say, having a, an, ind you know, an independent group or political parties do it themselves? Well, having us do it, it was we are an independent uh, organization of the assembly. So it ensures the independence of the process. It ensures that we also have the ability to utilize as many other, other government agencies as for our data collection. We have a working arrange, arrangement with Elections Canada and with MPAC to ensure that we have the most up-to-date information possible on that list. Now, 2011 is not only an election year, but it's a census year as well. What's this province's plan to redistrict our ridings in time for that 2011 election? Well, Bill 231, which was just recently introduced into the, the, the Legislative Assembly, did not make any uh, amendments to redistribute distribute prior to 2011. Uh, ultimately, it would be the determination of the government to determine when they want to, to redistribute, redistribute, but I would suggest that that likely would, would occur likely after the 2011 So the election. boundaries are the same next time? That would be 107 my, MPPs, is that right? Well, ultimately, that will be the determination of the Legislative Assembly, but based on what I've seen to date, I, I would suspect that would be the case. Okay, because you know some people got a bugaboo about this thing. There are some ridings in this province that have, for example, in downtown Toronto, 120,000 constituents in them. And then there are some other ridings, uh, say up in uh, northern Ontario, that have 40 or 50,000 constituents, which I guess technically means your vote's a little more punchy up north than it is down south. Do you have any plans to try to level that playing field at all? One of the things I identified in my uh, submission to the Select Committee on Elections was the fact that there was the disparity, as you just articulated. Uh, and it was my recommendation that Ontario was one of the few provinces in, in Canada that did not have a, a regularized process to redistribute the, the, the writings. And my recommendation to the Select Committee was, in fact, that they introduce legislation to put us onto a more regular schedule so, in fact, we could, we could deal with those discrepancies. Turnout's a big deal, and turnout has, let's bring this graph up if we can here, this graph. Uh, we tracked it since 1945 to the last Ontario election in 2007, and, you know, that line, I guess with a little blip up in the middle there, uh, seems headed in a downward, downward, downward direction. 53% of eligible voters voted in the last election. Uh, do we have a democratic deficit in this province? I don't believe so, Steve. We are seeing North America-wide, Western Europe and Japan, many, many jurisdictions are seeing a downward spiral uh, in voter turnout. And really I see that as, as a shared responsibility. It's a responsibility of Elections Ontario. My role is to sure, ensure that every eligible Ontarian knows where to vote, when to vote, what they need to do to vote. Candidates and political parties have a role, though. They need to ensure what are the issues, what are the platforms that they're running on that will engage the electorate to come out to vote. The media have an important role to play as well, to inform and educate uh, the electorate on what the issues are, take editorial positions on that, and ultimately, the elector themselves need to inform themselves, determine what positions they, they, they feel most closely to, what type of government they wish to have and uh, represent their views, and, and that's the beauty of democracy. Well, you've no doubt heard this expression, garbage in, garbage out, and I want to find out whether or not the information upon which you're basing that 53% turnout is actually accurate. Here's my anecdotal story, and you, t if that's not redundant, and you tell me if this makes sense. I got a home somewhere in a city, and I get my notice to come out and vote. I got a cottage, and I get my notice to come out and vote there as well. I vote in one location, which means as far as I'm concerned, I'm a 100% turnout because I voted. But as far as you're concerned, I'm a 50% turnout because I didn't vote in one of those other locations. Is that happening here? In Ontario, that's not happening because at the provincial level, you're only allowed to vote once. So even though you may own multiple properties, so you may have your cottage in Muskoka but live here in the city, you are to vote in respect of your residence, so to vote in respect of your home here in Toronto. Um, we endeavor very, very, we spend a great deal of time and effort to ensure that those duplications, those, that data duplication that we might receive from Elections Canada or MPAC, that we work diligently to try and remove those names, that that does not in fact happen. Unfortunately, at times, 
because of the, the uh, period of time in which we receive the data, sometimes there are duplications, and in fact, a few electors might receive those cards. Just a few? My hunch is it's more than that. I just hear this all the time, and my, which, which, if that's true, then the 53% is actually a lot higher than it is. I think that overall, we are starting to engage all of our data providers, we're starting to engage our local communities, our returning officers, to, to use that wide band of network to ensure that in fact by the time we get to 2011 that that voters list is as accurate and as reliable as possible. One of the things that I, that I constantly hear in my discussions with the, the, the local MPPs is that we do need to take a more proactive approach in between elections to ensure that in fact we have as accurate a list as possible. Okay, during Dalton McGuinty's first term the Elections Act was amended and we had a whole bunch of new things come forward. For example, we now have fixed election dates. So instead of the Premier calling the election whenever he wants, it's every four years, assuming it's a majority government. You've extended the number of days of advanced voting. You're keeping the polls open an extra hour on election day. Uh, all of this in order to enable people uh, to have fewer excuses, I guess, to, uh, to stay away from the polls and get them to come out and vote. So with all of these extra things that you guys are doing, how much of it is really the responsibility of the voter to, you know, just find that hour during the course of the day and get out and vote? Uh, again, that's where I'd go back. I, I believe it's a shared responsibility. It's shared between ourselves to inform the electorate of where to go, when to vote, go, and what they need to do to vote. The candidates and the parties have a, a, an equal responsibility to ensure that they're, that they're articulating the issues of the day that, that will galvanize the, the community to get themselves out to, to vote. And ultimately, though, the elector has to take some responsibility. They're the ones that need to educate themselves, understand what the issues are, and understand the importance of democracy and why it's important that they come out and exercise their, their vote. Now that the elections are always going to be in October, this opens up the possibility that, for example, in university or college towns, you've got this big kind of last-minute influx of students, uh, in some cases thousands of students, into, into ridings. Uh, who are temporary residents, uh, who will vote in that temporary residence as opposed to going home to their parents' place and right. voting in that riding where they grew up, uh, presumably. Uh, it, should we be concerned about that? Well, Bill 231, which was recently introduced in December, now proposes at least the, the opportunity that a student can actually self-declare where, in fact, they would, they would like their residence to be. Uh, I'm quite hopeful that that bill will be debated sometime early in the new year and that those provisions or amendments, however the Legislative Assembly sees fit, will be introduced early enough that we can communicate that to students so prior to them leaving for whichever educational institution they're, they're moving to in 2011, they will know their rights. They'll be informed that in fact they could self-declare if that is part of the new legislative package to allow them to Does vote Does that there. skew the vote though? I'm not sure it skews the vote. I think it makes it much more convenient for the electorate, and in this case, students, to actually vote where they actually are residing at the time. Okay. And again, if getting more people to participate is part of what you're all about, internet voting, is that on your agenda? Uh, I currently chair a, a working group of chief electoral officers across the country where we are all looking at internet voting and e-voting, trying to identify what the principles and standards should be if we were to move in that in that. Uh, in that regard. Ultimately, again, it's up to the Legislative Assembly to determine whether or not they wish to do so. But they take their cues from you. You're the expert on this. Would you recommend it if you found that it might be a good way to get people to come out more? I think ultimately as technology advances, there will be a day where, where the, the modernization of the electoral process ultimately move, will move in that direction. Will that day come in 2011? I don't believe it'll come in 2011, but I do believe at some point we will see a move towards a more modern, responsive uh, electoral process in that regard. We know federally there's a ban on uh, union and corporate donations to political parties, and this is all, I guess, is part of the thing that you're interested in as well. Right. Uh, would you want to see that happen provincially? During my uh, presentations before the Select Committee, there were certain principles that I put forth to the, to the Select Committee in their deliberations to look at harmonizing the rules between federal and provincial elections. At the end of the day, we have one elector, we have one taxpayer, and it is my belief that we should be treating them as, as in such a similar fashion. So harmonizing as, as much as possible the, the process, the procedures, and the laws pertaining to that, I would be advocating on behalf of. Do you know if that's going to happen in time for the next election? I have not seen it to date, uh, any amendments but as I say, Bill 231 was just introduced. There'll be an opportunity for debate in the House and ultimately p potential amendments to that. Okay. Uh, 2007, you weren't the, the Chief Electoral Office in the last election, 207, right. but you are now. 
uh, you'll remember, though, of course, that we had this referendum. We had the Citizens Assembly come forward with recommendations on how to change our system from first past the post to something involving uh, more proportional representation uh, of uh, electing our politicians. Um, it went down in flames, but a lot of people thought it was kind of an interesting exercise. Would you like to see something like that happen again? I, I would suggest at this point, Steve, that, that it is unlikely we will see another referendum anytime soon. I recently was out to British Columbia where they, in fact, uh, ran a similar type of referendum for the second time, and, and that did not pass. It, it appears that the, the uh, electorate is, has spoken quite uh, resoundingly across the country that it does not appear to be a de desire to move, move past, first past the post. Okay, one last question. Um, and it's only because we see how elections are sometimes conducted in other countries around the world that uh, we may take for granted how relatively clean our elections are. But you would know, so tell us, how much cheating goes on during elections here in Ontario? I, have not, I don't believe that there is much cheating whatsoever. Much, uh, but some, right? I don't believe there's any cheating whatsoever. None? Uh, as my role as Chief Electoral Officer, my role is to enforce the provisions of, of the Election Act and the Election Finances Act. If there are complaints made to my office, we initiate investigations right, right away and investigate that. You think there's uh, any ballot box stuffing going on out there? No, not, not whatsoever. None. No, so uh, every vote is kosher as far as you know. The integrity of our electoral process is paramount and is the one thing that we, we have been able to achieve in the many, many years of conducting elections here in Ontario is that we've always maintained the integrity, the transparency of the process and the secret of the ballot. Anything so, go, any, any stories you've heard that you want to share with us? Not, a, not at this point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not at this point, meaning there are, but you don't want to tell us? No, 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 no not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Okay, we'll leave it there. Greg Essensa, Chief Electoral Officer, Province of Ontario. Thanks for coming into TVO Thank tonight. you very much, Steve. Appreciate that. <laughs>